So a number of years ago, I was living in Colorado. My family was living in Colorado. And uh, a, buddy, a buddy of mine and myself, we decided to do kind of the man in the street interviews with people in Denver. So we got his video camera, and we went down to Denver to the 16th Street Mall and to some parks, and we began to interview people uh, on camera and ask them one question. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? This is the question that we asked, and as you can imagine, the answers that we received were fairly diverse, all sorts of different ideas, and so on. Now, if you were to do this uh, here in Wichita or Andover, if you were to go to Wichita State to the campus, walk around, or maybe to Old Town and just ask some people, very candidly, who is Jesus? What sort of answers do you think that you would get? Some of the answers that I've gotten uh, was this. Jesus is a historical figure that we read about. That's it. Others would say that Jesus is a very spiritual person, a spiritual teacher. Some would say that Jesus is a person that helps others to believe in themselves. Right? Jesus helps us to believe in ourselves. Others said that he is an enlightened figure. He is a giver of wisdom. Or he is the ultimate archetype of what humanity ought to be. Now, if you were to ask another 10 people or so, you'd probably get 10 more answers of who Jesus is. Jesus has become this figure that we've kind of molded in our minds. Uh, we've determined, and ultimately, we've kind of uh, formed Jesus after our own image, rather than recognizing it's the other way around. So as important as these questions are for us to be able to ask, perhaps what is more important is what if somebody walks up to you and asks you the question, who is Jesus? How would you answer? How would you respond to this question, who is Jesus? Now, according to the 2020 State of Theology survey done by Ligonier Ministries, they do the survey every two years. If you were to go out in the streets and ask people, who is Jesus? 52% of Americans would say that Jesus is a good teacher, but he is not the Son of God. 52%, the people in America, would say that Jesus is a good teacher, but he is not the Son of God. Over half the country denies or rejects the claims of Christ. They deny or reject what Jesus says about himself, who he claims to be. They deny or reject that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, this is not an in-the-weeds sort of Christological discussion. This is not a deep theological claim to make that Jesus is the Son of God. This is Christianity 101, right? This is the absolute foundation of the faith, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This is a question that church throughout history has made abundantly clear, that we have always held as a foundational truth that Jesus is the Son of God, dating all the way back, certainly, to the Scriptures. But the earliest creed that we have and throughout history, we have creeds and confession that claim over and over and over again, Jesus is the Son of God. But the earliest one that we have is the Apostles' Creed. It dates back to the second century. This is one of the oldest foundational documents, creeds of the church. This is one of those creeds to say, if you agree with the Apostles' Creed, we, are, we can be in fellowship with one another. If you disagree with the Apostles' Creed, then you are outside of the faith. It is that basic of a creed. It is the borders, if you would, in creedal form of what the Christian church believes. Now, in the Apostles' Creed, it says this. It begins this way. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. From the very beginning, the Christian church has held to this truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. This belief that Jesus is God's Son is the foundation of our faith. Yet, 
50%, 52% of our country rejects that. They do not believe this to be true. This is concerning. It should be eye-opening. But what is more concerning is the fact that the State of Theology survey not only surveys people on the street, but it also surveys evangelical churches. They go into the church and they ask this same question. Is Jesus Christ the Son of God? What do you believe about Jesus? Who is Jesus? And within Bible-believing evangelical churches, 30% believe that Jesus is a good teacher, but not the Son of God. 30% believe that Jesus is not the Son of God. 30% of evangelical churches deny the foundation upon which we stand. This means that only 70% of professing evangelical Christians in America today believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Seven out of ten. In other words, basically one-third of the evangelical church is completely heretical and apostate. This is a stomach-turning figure. This is an eye-opening stat. And at the same time, it's incredibly humbling. It's incredibly humbling. And if we are honest with ourselves, this figure should not surprise us. If we're really honest, when we, if we were to look back at evangelicalism today, this number should not surprise us. The reason that it should not surprise us is because the evangelical church for quite some time has been completely theologically and biblically malnourished. It has become completely famine. The evangelical church has, as Hebrew says, become dull of hearing. In Hebrews chapter 5, literally this means they become dumb to their hearing. They don't hear. They choose not to hear. They become dull or dumb. We have fed ourselves theological formula, infamil, and Gerber baby food, rather than feasting on the meat of God's word. And as Hebrews says, everyone who lives on milk alone on the milk of the word, is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a child. The evangelical church is so malnourished in the truth of Christ that we have become weak, emasculated, woke, and supporters of all sorts of evils. We are more interested in the book, The Jesus Calling, than we are Chalcedonian or Cerulean Christology. We are more interested in the top 10 at Lifeway or Christian best booksellers, whatever, than we are with the Apostles' Creed or the Chalcedonian Creed or the Athanasian Creed. We have become more interested in pop culture, Caleb music than we are with singing the Psalms. There's something wrong here. And we think that it's spiritual when we think of ourselves as being spiritual, when we gather with our brothers and sisters around the table or a Bible study and we begin to share, well, this is what Jesus means to me. Right? This is what Jesus means to me. This is what I feel the Bible is saying. Not realizing what we have done when we say that. We are completely unaware that we are making our own internal subjective feelings the determiner of our perspective of the second person of the Trinity. That's problematic. To be honest, I really don't care what Jesus means to you. I'm far more interested in who Jesus actually is according to the word of God. Church, if we're going to stand faithful in our day, we must know who Jesus is. If we're going to stand faithful in our day, we must stand on the foundation that is Christ. For anywhere else, any other foundation is crumbling and it is sinking sand. If we are going to be truth tellers in the world today, we must stand on the foundation of Christ, for he is the very definition of truth. If we're going to be peacemakers, we must stand on the foundation of Christ, for he is our peace. If righteousness and justice are to prevail, we must stand upon the foundation of Christ. And if we are to be a people of joy and love and grace and mercy, we must stand upon the foundation of Christ because joy, love, grace, and mercy are found nowhere else. Church, Christ and him crucified must be the very center of our faith. 
It must be the very center of our lives. Christ in him crucified is the helix which every aspect of our lives is to revolve around. Everything. The way that we live, the way that we manage our time, the way that we manage our finances, the way that we manage our relationships, our family, our work, our hobbies, our free time, our calendars, every aspect of our lives must wrap itself around Christ and him crucified. And if it does not, it will wither and wilt, and you will fall, and you will be shown to be maybe perhaps one of the 30% that even deny that Jesus is the Son of God. We must stand upon the foundation that is Christ. There is no moving past Jesus. There is no moving beyond Jesus. There is only moving deeper into the mystery of Christ, moving deeper into the glory of Christ, moving deeper into the majesty and the revelation of Christ. He must be the center of all things. He must flavor and marinate every part of our lives. As St. Patrick says in his famous prayer, he he says this. He says, Christ with you, Christ before you, Christ behind you, Christ in you, Christ beneath you, Christ above you, Christ to your right and Christ to your left, Christ when you lie down and Christ when you sit down, Christ in the heart of every person who thinks of you, Christ in the mouth of every person who speaks of you, Christ in the eyes of every person who sees you, and Christ in the ear of every person who hears you. Church, this must be our prayer. Christ in everything. When I speak, I want people to hear Christ. When people look at me, I want them to see Christ. When people think about me, I want them to think thoughts of Christ. This must be our prayer. Christ at the very center of everything. We must be a people who are marked by being absolutely obsessed with Christ. He must be our obsession. May we be a people who live and move and find our being in Christ. And may it be that we stand so firmly upon the foundation that is Christ in our lives, that he permeates every aspect of our lives, that when somebody comes up to you and says, who is Jesus? Your response would be, well, how much time do you have? How much time do you have? May we be a people who stand so firmly on the foundation of Christ that if someone asks, who is Jesus? You might look at your watch and say, buckle up, because I've got a lot to say. You want to know who Jesus is? You want to know what I think about Jesus? Let me tell you. Let me tell you about how he eternally existed within the triune God, the eternal word, who is one with the Father in substance and in nature. Let me tell you about Jesus, how he is the spoken word of creation, and how by him and through him and for him all things exist. Let me tell you about the one who made covenant with Adam, with Noah, with Abraham, with Moses, with David, and with me. Let me tell you about this one. Let me tell you about the one who parted the Red Sea. Let me tell you about the one who caused the mountain to shake before Elijah. Let me tell you about the one who brought the dead back to life. Let me tell you about the one who stood with the three faithful in the fiery furnace. Let me tell you about the one who closed the mouths of lions. Let me tell you about the one who went to war and defeated the gods of Egypt. Let me tell you about the one who brings peace, shalom, wholeness to the world. Let me tell you about the one who in himself is the very definition of beauty. Let me tell you about the one who is eternally faithful, who has storehouses of mercy, the one whose love Hesed love extends to a thousand generations. Who is Jesus? Man, let's have an answer. Let us have an answer. Church, it is not, or church, to not have an answer to this question. If we do not have an answer to the basic question, who is Jesus, is to build a house upon the sand, and I guarantee you the storms are coming and the house will fall. We must stand upon the foundation of Christ. We build on the foundation of Christ. Who is Jesus? This is the most important question that could possibly be asked. And it is the most important answer that any one person or the world will ever hear. John's gospel is perhaps the greatest place to go to understand this answer. Who is is Jesus. John's gospel has what is considered the highest Christology of all the gospels. 
Christology is the study of Christ. It does not only tell us about the life of Jesus. It doesn't only tell us the stories of Jesus. But it tells us what we are to believe about Jesus. John does this through discourse and miracles and signs and debate back and forth through monologues and dialogues. And as we move further into John chapter 5, we are entering a very thick forest, a dense forest of Christology. This is heavy stuff. Jesus is about to go on one of the longest monologues in the Gospel of John, and he begins to talk about who he is in relation to the Father. So, this morning, what I want us to do is look at just a couple verses, just the introduction to this monologue, and continue to orient our minds around biblical Christology, be able to answer the question, who is Jesus? And if we have our minds oriented and calibrated right, then over the next couple of weeks, as we move through John chapter 5, we will see Christ glorified in ways, perhaps, that we've never seen him before. But ultimately, church, if my goal, my hope for you, both old and young, is that if somebody asks you, who is Jesus, you have an answer. You have the answer. So John chapter 5 thus far has been about the healing of the man by the pool of Bethesda, the man who has been lame for 38 years, and Jesus comes to him and heals him. The Pharisees hear about this healing, and they interrogate the man, and the man points to Jesus, and then they go to Jesus, and they come to him with two charges. You are a Sabbath breaker, and you claim to be equal with God. You are a Sabbath breaker, and you claim to be equal with God. This claim that he is equal with God is what we're going to focus on this morning because 30% of the evangelical church does not believe that to be true. We see this charge come in John 5, verse 18, where it says this. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father making himself equal with God. This is why they wanted to kill him. Sabbath breaker and calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So what did Jesus do to cause the Jewish leaders, these Pharisees, to be so upset and to level this charge of blasphemy toward Jesus that you say you are equal with God? What is it that Jesus said? Well, that comes in the two previous verses. Look with me at verse 16 and 17. It says this, and this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus. That is to hunt down and destroy Jesus. Because he was doing these things on the Sabbath, Sabbath breaker. And then in verse 17, it says, but Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Making himself equal with God and calling God his father. That is enough to cause the religious minds of the Pharisees to have an aneurysm. It is enough to make them so angry that all they want to do is destroy Jesus. You do not say that. You do not say that you are equal with God. There is a problem here. So again, for us to understand this, for us to wrestle through this Christology, we have to ask the question, in what way is Jesus equal with God? In what way is he saying, when he he says, my father is working until now, and I am working, is he declaring that he is somehow equal with God? Is God still working? You see, absolutely. You see, we are not deists. Deists believe that God created the world, he wound it up, and he set it loose, and he stepped back and just watches it unfold. This is what the deists believe, that God is real, he is true, he is creator, but he's not sustainer. He is not involved in the everyday workings of our lives or of the world. However, we reject that. We say, no, 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 deism is false. We believe that God not only created the world, but that he also sustains the world. After all, who is it that makes the sun rise and makes the wind blow? Who brings in and pushes out the tide? Who gives birds songs to sing and who causes waves to roar and fish to swarm? Who sends the stars throughout the sky and foxes to their holes? 
Who sustains every breath that you are breathing right now? God. Christ. He is still working. You see, the Sabbath rest of the seventh day indeed says that God was resting, but we know that what he was resting from was his creative work of the first six days, and he does this as an example for us. So we know how to rest after working. However, this does not mean that God completely disengaged himself from his creation. No, he is still involved. He is still intimately involved far more than we realize in sustaining and holding things together. In fact, Hebrews 1.3 says this, speaking of Jesus, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So Jesus says that the Father is working, and so Jesus is working. He does what the Father does. If the Lord is working, then he is working. If the Lord is about, or if the Father is about bringing about a new creation, even on the sixth day of the week, then Jesus is about bringing forth a new creation, even on the sixth day of the week. Now, this really upsets the Pharisees. So much so that, they, again, they want to kill him. And first, the first offense is the fact that Jesus calls God his Father. This is completely offensive to the Jewish sensibilities. Only about four times in the whole Old Testament is this phrase used of somebody calling Yahweh their father. And those four times are pointing to Christ, who is to come. Right? This is not something that was common. People did not talk this way, which is why the Lord's Prayer was so incredibly uh, controversial in his day when he teaches the disciples how to pray. When you pray, pray like this, Our Father who art in heaven. I was like, whoa, you don't do that. You do not call him your father. And then the second reason they were so upset is to say that if God is working, therefore I am working. This is to say that you are doing what God is doing. This is to say that you are equal with the father. This is problematic. Now, at this point, Jesus could have eased the tense situation, right? We know that they want to kill him. Then we know that they're hunting him. They want to destroy Jesus for these claims. And he could have easily backed off just a little bit uh, and said, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm not saying I'm equal with God. This is, in fact, what the Arians said he did. Arianism is an ancient Christological heresy, which we'll get into in a little while. But they said, no, Jesus actually tried to back away from this claim that he is equal with God. However, that's not true. In fact, in verse 19, we see Jesus double down on this very fact that he is equal with God. Look at verse 19 with me. It says, So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. Now the Pharisees are really upset. Now this this is the start of this very long, dense monologue about Christology, but we're just going to focus here this morning. And we want to ask the question, what does it mean that the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing? How do we understand this? How is he saying that I'm unified with the Father, so much so that I can do nothing on my own, but only what I see the Father doing? What sort of things does Jesus do? What sort of things does he do? And can he only do those things after seeing the Father likewise do them? So if, if we're to try to break this down and, and really understand what's going on here in verse 19, let's, let's look at creation as an example. Right? Jesus does all sorts of things, but John chapter 1, verse 3 tells us explicitly that Jesus is responsible for creation. John 1, 3 says, All things were made through him, and without him, was not anything made that was made. Pretty straightforward, right? Jesus is the creator God. So if we think about creation and say, okay, Jesus can do nothing on his own accord, but only that which he sees his father doing, how do we understand creation? How is it that the world came into existence? So when it comes to creation, what does he mean? Well, some would like to suggest that Jesus does nothing on his own, but that he responds 
to what he sees God doing. So if it was creation, or even think about a a building project, maybe God is the architect. He writes the blueprints, he gets all the permits, he puts everything in place, and then Jesus responds by actually constructing the building. Is this what John is talking about? Is this what Jesus is talking about? No. Jesus does not respond to the Father. Others have suggested that Jesus is imitating the Father. That Jesus sees the Father do something, and then Jesus likewise imitates what the Father has done. So when it comes to creation, it would be like this, that God, the Father, creates something, creates the heavens and the earth, and then Jesus imitates him by making the heavens and the earth. An imitation, heavens and earth, as if Jesus is the greatest mimic of all time. That's clearly not what's going on here. And we know that because of what John 1, 3 says. Everything was created through Christ. And without Christ, nothing has been made that which has been made. So, there is no creation of the Father and then somehow an imitation creation of the Son. So how should we understand what Jesus means here? What claim is Jesus making about himself in relation to God the Father, particularly as it relates to him working, him creating things, him doing things that he sees the Father doing. So Jesus is not saying that he responds to the Father. He is not saying that he imitates the Father. He is not saying that he just obeys the Father or mimics the Father or echoes the Father. This is not what Jesus is saying. But rather, he is saying that he acts in complete unity with the Father. He is saying that he is one with the Father, that he is equal with the Father. So let's try to think about an example, how to figure this out. If you were to go home today and pick up a pen and a piece of paper to write a letter to your loved ones, right? If I was to write a Dear Mandy letter, I would sit down and my mind and my heart, my inner self, I would begin to think about what these words are going to say, what letters I'm going to write. And as I'm thinking about this, my hand would then pick up the pen and begin to write. My inner self is not in any way um, contrary or opposed to my hand. My hand is no more really me than my mind or my heart. Both are completely me. Your hand is no greater than your mind, and your mind is no greater than your hand. Your mind is no more you than your hand is you. Both your hand and your mind are of one substance. They're of one nature. It is together. You are wholly one person. So what Jesus is saying, in keeping with the analogy, is that he is like the hand, and he does nothing apart from the mind, which is the Father. The hand never writes a single letter that the mind did not determine or decide to write. The mind is not thinking of writing one letter, and the hand is writing a separate letter. So when Jesus says, I do nothing apart from the Father, that's basically saying, as one, the hand I construct, I put my hands to, I do absolutely nothing that is contrary, opposed to, or outside of the Father, outside of the mind. For how can it? It is of one substance. So is Jesus equal with God, as the Pharisees claim? Yes, but not only that, he is God Again, contrary to what 30% of the evangelical church seems to believe. For the Jewish leaders and for us to know, to not know, or to not understand who Jesus is, is to not know and not understand who God is. For they are one. The foundation upon which they, those Jewish leaders, were standing was on a fault line. It was shaking as Jesus claimed without hesitation to be one with the Father. Now, if we follow the story of Jesus throughout the Gospels, we will say that this sort of, or we'll see that this sort of confusion is rampant throughout the stories. Nobody understands who Jesus is. The disciples don't get it. They go throughout those three years of ministry not really grasping who Jesus actually is. The Pharisees certainly don't understand it. Jesus' own mother does not understand it. His brothers don't understand it. The crowds don't understand it. We don't know who Jesus is until the 
cross and the resurrection. In fact, throughout the, the, the Gospel of Mark, there is a, a theme, a story of people not quite understanding who Jesus is. There's these testifying to who he is, but they all come short. But the final testimony that we see is from the Roman centurion who is standing at the foot of the cross after Jesus gave up his spirit and the temple of the curtain, or <laughs> the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Yes, the curtain of the temple was torn in two and he looks in and he sees and then he proclaims the truest testimony in the Gospel of Mark. Truly, this man was the Son of God. We don't know who Christ is apart from the cross and apart from the resurrection. For the resurrection and the cross is what allows the world to see Jesus for who he truly is. It is on the cross and the resurrection that vindicates Jesus' claims to be God. It is the cross and resurrection that pulls back the veil and allows the world to see Jesus as the true king, as the savior of the world, as God in flesh. And this is why these 12 seemingly cowardly followers, disciples of Jesus, after they see the resurrection, are transformed into courageous, bold proclaimers of the gospel, so much so that they go to their death proclaiming this message. From cowards to heroes. Why? Because they finally saw, they finally understood Jesus is God. And the resurrection and the cross is what demonstrates this beautiful truth to the disciples, to the world, and to us. He rose again at the, as the divine and eternal king to rule the nations. So this question, who is Jesus, is the most important question one can ask. And again, because the answer is the only answer the world needs to hear. The wrong answer leads to worlds of dysfunction. To get Jesus wrong is to get everything wrong, right? To get Jesus wrong is to get everything wrong. Where we see dysfunction and evil in the world, we see it because Jesus is not believed to be the Son of God. Where we see dysfunction and evil in the church, we see it as a place where the church doesn't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. If the entire Christian faith does not wrap itself around Christ and him crucified, then the entire faith is doomed to wither and wilt and fall. If the world does not wrap itself around Christ and him crucified, the world likewise will wither and wilt and fall. Every aspect of life and faith must wrap itself around the cross of Christ. For if the cross is not central, if it does not stand at the very center of your life, again, if your life is not wrapped around Jesus and him crucified, then everything is gone. Everything slips away. If the cross is not central, then the divinity of Christ is gone. We have no reason to say that he's the son of God if the cross is not central. The hope and peace of God's kingdom will perish. The new creation which is here present, will not be present. It will be somewhere in the future. Because Jesus, or the Paul says, that if you are in Christ, then you are a new creation. But if Christ is not central, and you're not in him, then there is no new creation. Everything revolves around Christ and him crucified. If the cross is not central, then every part of our faith dissolves for we are still in our sins, and Christ was nothing more than a good teacher. So, I want to ask this question again. Who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Do you see him, church? Do you see him as 100% God and 100% man? Do you see him upon the cross, the God-man, the unique one, who is able to bear your sins and bring you into the glory of God? Do you see him as one who bore the wrath of God so that you could be set free? Do you see him as the victor, the one who upon the cross conquered Satan's sin and death and freed you from the dark powers of this world that would hold you condemned? Do you see him as the resurrected king, 
before whom you must bow. Do you see him now sitting at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning, and he will continue to do that until all the enemies are brought under his feet as a footstool? Do you see him as the very foundation of your life? Do you see him as the chief cornerstone of your entire existence? Church, we must see Christ this way. For this is who he is, and to see him in any other way is to be delusional. From day one, the church has had to defend the faith around this question, who is Jesus? The earliest attacks upon the church were attacks against who Jesus is. Now, there are all sorts of ancient Christological errors and heresies that the church has had to deal with. Ebonism was one of them in the first and second century. Ebonism was this Hebrew sort of flavor of Christianity, but they actually said there is no way that Yahweh, the Old Testament God, would actually dwell in flesh with man. So what they, they said is that Jesus is actually not divine at all. He's just a good teacher. And by his own righteousness, he has kind of earned his place as a great example for the church. They did not believe that Jesus was the eternal logos, word, or wisdom embodied in flesh. They rejected all of Paul's letters because, well, Paul loves to talk about Christ and his divinity. So they rejected all of that. Not only that, you had docetism, right? Docetism was a theological outlook in the early church that maintained that Jesus did not actually come in the flesh, but he just appeared to be in the flesh. Because there's no way that the divine God would actually take upon human decayed and corrupt flesh. Right? These are two ends of the spectrum where Ebonism is saying, no, he's just man, no God. And then Docetism on the other side is saying, no, he's just God, not man. He only appeared to be man. It was like ghostly, (laughs) a great mirage, a great trick. That when you saw him suffer and get tortured and crucified, when he hungered, all of these were just what it appeared to be. It didn't actually happen. You have Arianism, which I mentioned earlier. Arianism was a fourth century heresy, and this is one that is very tricky, right? In fact, it's found a, a wonderful home today in the Mormon church and in the Jehovah's Witness church. Arianism likes to say, no, he is certainly God, and he's certainly man, but he is, his divinity is less than the Father's, right? So there was a time where Jesus did not exist. The Father existed, and at some point in time, Jesus then existed, and he is eternally subordinate to the Father, not actually equal with him. You have Apollinarianism. Apollinarianism is a nice big juicy word, right, that says that Jesus existed in the flesh, but his mind was divine. His inner man was divine. He didn't have a human mind or uh, a human soul, but it was God who kind of stripped out all the humanity outside of the body and entered in and dwelled there. Now, what this does is it tries to take the hypostatic union of Christ being 100% man and 100% God and say, no, it's actually 50-50, right? He's 50% God, 50% man. There are all sorts of other Christological errors throughout church history that have come to attack Jesus Christ being the Son of God equal with the Father. And it still happens today. In fact, throughout all of these ancient heresies that I've just mentioned, have a common thread, and that common thread is Gnosticism, right? The Gnostic idea is that there's no way divinity and humanity that which is spiritual and that which is physical, that which is eternal and that which is temporal, can actually coexist together. So Gnosticism wants to pull them apart, go into the world of ideas and truth and forms like Plato talks about, versus the the corrupt nature of of wood and flesh and grass and trees and human bodies. All of that, that is decayed. And what is good is just the ideas, the spiritual, the ethereal. This is what streams throughout all of these heresies because they don't want to acknowledge that Jesus, the true, divine, ultimate, eternal God, actually put on flesh and it was good. They see creation as bad. And church, let me tell you something. Gnosticism is alive and well today. Gnosticism is like a shape shifter, 
right? Owen and I often talk, and he talks about what kind of superpowers he, he wants to have, which ones I want to have. And he often says, that I wish I could be a shapeshifter. Right? So he could turn into this totally different looking character at a different time. Gnosticism is like this. It, it loves to, to shift its shape wherever it goes in order to become appealing to the people of God and appealing to the world. It is alive and well today. Gnosticism has found a wonderful home in the modern LGBTQ plus onslaught and movement. Gnosticism is strong within the woke church and social justice and CRT movements. Gnosticism is alive and well within evangelical Bible-believing churches, which is why 30% of evangelicals do not believe that Jesus is actually the Son of God, because Gnosticism has gotten its way in there and it begins to pull apart what God has put together. The evangelical church seems to have an allergy. It seems to have an allergy for the external means of grace. Rather, we like to focus on the subjective, internal feelings of faith. Okay, let let me say that again. The, the, The evangelical church seems to have this allergy. We're allergic to the physical, to the external means of grace, but rather we love to think about our walk with God as being completely internal, right? Internal, what I feel, what I think, what I believe, and not what is outside of us. Philip Carey wrote, the techniques, speaking of the new evangelical theology, the techniques all all have the characteristics that they turn you away from external things like the word of God, Christ in the flesh, and the life of the church in order to seek God in your heart, your life, and your experience. Underneath a lot of talk about being personal with God is a spirituality that actually leaves you alone and with yourself. I want to read that one more time because this is really important for us to hear. The techniques of the new evangelical theology all have the characteristic that they turn you away from external things like the word of God, Christ in the flesh, and the life of the church in order to seek God in your heart your life, and your experience. Underneath a, uh, underneath a lot of talk about being personal with God is a spirituality that actually leaves you alone and with yourself. Church, we are never to dive deeper into ourselves to try and find hope or comfort. That is not what we do, but that's what the church loves to tell you to do. We never are to dive deeper into ourselves, our feelings, our experiences, our own ability to to, to hold on to an idea to find hope or comfort. We We are called to go outside of ourselves to the cross of Christ and find our hope and our comfort there. We are not called to dive deeper into ourselves to find love and acceptance. No, we are to go outside of ourselves to the cross of Christ, to the body of Christ, the church to his word, to the waters of baptism, to his table. This is the means of grace that God has given to comfort and encourage his people. This is how we know we are his. Not by this internal subjective feeling. I I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had and how much I have wrestled with this. That my internal feelings of how much do I love with God, love God just wanes back and forth. And I feel like, oh, I'm not a good Christian. Oh, my goodness. I have no hope. I have no comfort. So I, I go in and I try to convince myself. That is not where my hope, my comfort, or love, or acceptance comes from. We come to Christ and his word, the crucified Christ, who died on a cross, who physically bled for us who physically gives us a meal that we come to every week, who physically dumps us into the waters of baptism, who physically has given us and speaks to us his word, who has physically given us his body, the church, to commune with, do all the one another's with. Gnosticism would see all of this go away as being inferior. But these are the means of grace that God has given us. You see, the world looks for definitions of love, within themselves. What is love? We go inside and we try to figure it out, which is why the LGBTQ plus movement is finding its way into the church because this is what the evangelical church has been doing. 
going internal, trying to find out what true love is. Yet every description we have of love should be wrapped around the cross of Christ. Crucifying our own desires is love. The woke movement is looking for justice and peace within the self. Yet every description we have of justice and peace should be wrapped around the cross of Christ. Justice and peace was accomplished on the cross. Without the cross being central, we don't know what love is. We do not know what justice is. We do not know what righteousness is. We do not know what peace is. And certainly we should not look within ourselves to try to find them. We look to Christ. To know what justice is, to know what love is, to know what peace is, we go to the author of these things. We go to the one who rules and reigns, the one who put on flesh, completely God, completely man. We go to the one who is the answer or the question that we first asked with, and we answer it, who is Jesus? We go to him. For Jesus is the source of all that the world needs. Jesus is the foundation of love. He is the pillar of justice and truth. He is the eternal spring of joy. He is the everlasting fount of peace. And he is the all-time objective standard for what is beautiful. Church, we must hold to this Christ. We must stand upon this foundation. We must never go back to drinking the milk of the word but we must always be moving further and deeper into the depths of Christ. May we stand firm on this unshakable foundation of Christ and his kingdom. Hebrews talks about Jesus' foundation, his kingdom, as being an unshakable kingdom. And over the last year and a half, the Lord has taken hold of this world and he has shaken it a little bit. And what we see are kingdoms crumbling convictions falling. We see people losing their minds, living in fear. And church, if you have experienced this, then come back and stand upon the foundation of Christ because it is an unshakable foundation. It is one that we live in with confidence and boldness. We do not need to fear. We do not need to be afraid or anxious for anything for he is the foundation of the unshakable kingdom. And may we always be ready to give an answer when the world asks, who is Jesus? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that in Christ you have given us hope, love, joy, peace, goodness, justice, mercy. Lord, you have poured yourself out in Christ upon us. Lord, you have brought us into your unshakable kingdom. Lord, you have ministered to us through your word. You have ministered to us through your body, the encouraging words of the church. You have ministered to us through the waters of baptism and the table of the Lord's Supper. You have ministered to us through singing the songs uh, uh, that we have sung this morning. You have ministered to us by singing psalms. Lord, you are sovereign and in control of all things. Lord, may we rest in what you are doing in and through us in Christ. Lord, we praise you and thank you for all that you do. In your name we pray.